So welcome to the IDS education class. We're glad you're here today. Uh, we hope that you'll uh, see the purpose of what we're doing here today. Over the years, we have provided education since education became a law in the state of Utah for a dealer to uh, be able to um, know what's going on legislatively and to renew your license. So your license renewal will be coming up and expire at the end of June with renewal July 1. The one thing I will, will remind you as we do every year is don't wait till the last week of June to renew your license, do it early, okay? Should be able to do everything electronically. The state tells us everything will work just like it did last year. Hope there, hopefully there won't be any hiccups. If you have hiccups or whatever in the system, let us know because we can't let them know that they need to fix something if we don't know, all right? So we appreciate you uh, being here and giving us your input because there have been a lot of things going on uh, during the past uh, well over a year that are uh, very important to the auto industry. Um, probably more so than I've seen in the whole history which I've been the director of the association. And so it's really important that we get your feedback. So today all of you should have the handout that goes with the class today. We're gonna go through this. I'm not gonna go through word by word with you uh, in this handout uh, because I want to get you back to your business and selling cars. But the important thing is that when you get done with the class, you'll know what the changes are and you'll be able to go back to your dealership and say, okay, here's, I need to implement this, I need to do this, I need to stop doing this, and I need to follow through with this, okay? That's our goal today, as it is with all of our education classes. <clears throat> so that all of you know, my name's Wayne Jones. Um, I think some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm the director of the Used Car Dealers Association of Utah. Been the director for 42 years. Um, we've seen a lot come and go, a lot of water under the bridge over the years. A lot of good things, a lot of bad things, but we're here as an association to represent you. That's who we represent. We work for you. And we want to make sure that all of you are well represented to do that. We need your participation. So if you'll open your book, we're going to get started with that today. <clears throat> on the very first page, obviously there's a cover page, but on the inside cover, it uh, talks about our title service. We still have a number of title challenges that are out there that uh, sometimes are a little difficult to figure out. That's what IDS exists for, is to help you with your title work, with doing registration. You can bring your plates here, or excuse me, you can bring your title work here to have plates issued to your dealership. Uh, we have three offices, which are mentioned a little later, but uh, um, we have some excellent title clerks that have uh, many years of experience. We're typically the number one, two, and three offices in the state of Utah uh, for the fewest errors. Typically, we have zero. And so I have some really good title people, and if we can't find the answer, there probably isn't one out there, okay? And we'll have to make some special consideration with the uh, tax commission. Um, if any of you are interested in what we do downstairs at, in any of our three locations, um, you're welcome to go down there. We have all the forms and all those types of things available for you. On the next page is our welcome letter. This is kind of a reminder page about some of the things that we do and why IDS was uh, formed and why the association was formed. I will remind you that uh, what our purpose is, is to help bring the level of participation and the level of professionalism up in the industry. But a result of this class is we're not attorneys. A lot of people have accused me of being an attorney. I am not one, I don't wanna be, okay? But we deal with the law pretty much on a, on a daily basis with the tax commission and all the different government entities that you guys have to deal with. And we have very important contacts in those offices. You'll see from the testimonial on the inside cover from a dealer who had a bad experience with DMV, called us, we got the problem solved for him the next day, okay? That's the kind of stuff we do. We have the right connections, we have the right availability for you to be able to solve those problems for you. But I remind you that all of you operate your dealerships differently. The information we're gonna give you today, we're gonna give to you. It's up to you to go back and make sure it applies properly to your dealership. If you need to seek your own legal counsel, you can. We also have legal counsel available for you if you don't have an attorney. And that's really important because a lot of the legal counsel out there doesn't know anything about the car business. So just because you have a neighbor who's an attorney, don't rely necessarily on what they say because a lot of times they don't know, okay? So you need to have an attorney um, represent you that really knows the, the auto industry. <clears throat> Um, on the next page is our antitrust statement. We always have this. This is on uh, Roman numeral page six, by the way, the very first introductory section. Roman numeral six page says that we comply with antitrust laws 
anytime we have competitors in the same room, we have to do this disclosure. We even do it when we have board meetings because anytime we have competitors, they need to understand that we don't boycott, we don't talk about pricing, any of those types of things that are of an antitrust nature. Everybody clear on that? Perfect. Um, on the next page is our copyright and copyright infringement policy. We spent a lot of time and a lot of money keeping the forms legal. Um, those forms have been copyrighted. We ask you not to copy those. The money that you spend buying those forms from us goes to supporting you on Capitol Hill. So it's like paying yourself to use our supplies, okay, and our forms and all the things that we do. So we hope that you'll look that direction to do that. If you have a printer you like to use, have them call us. We can let, allow them to print any of those forms, but they have to have permission or we usually end up with a real ugly conversation between us and a printer, okay? Perfect. On the next several pages, excuse me, on uh, page, let me go to page eight first. On page eight is the location of all three of our offices. You can see we have one in Ogden, one in Orem, and of course here in Midvale. Um, we also have an attorney on file, if you will, or attorney information down toward the bottom of the page. We have insurance through the Vernon Group. We have an attorney. If you do need legal services, there's their information. And of course the local association. By the way, our association also affiliates with the National Independent Auto Dealers and your dues includes that automatically, okay? On the next three pages or so are some of our association partners that provide services that a lot of dealers have asked us about. I'm not going into this today because I don't want it to be a sales pitch, but I want you to know of some of the services that are available, okay? Anybody have any questions before we begin the fun part of legislation? Anybody want to take a guess how many bills they passed in 45 days? I always ask this question at the first of every year, don't I? Woohoo! Too many is usually the answer, right? <laughs> Actually, they do good. They do good work up there. Sometimes they get a little carried away, and that's where we kind of have to bring them down to back down to earth and say, "Okay, guys, here's what you're doing if you do this or you don't do this." So. 574 bills were passed this year out of nearly 1,200 that were actually numbered. And those are just the numbered bills. I have just a list on my tracking list of probably 150 bills that never got numbered from what we do. So it's something we need to be there uh, to represent you and make sure that things don't happen to you and affect your business in a negative way. As far as legislation goes, you'll see in part two of this presentation today, you'll, we'll walk through a lot of the bills that passed and didn't pass and why they didn't pass and why they did pass. But I wanted to spend the first part of our education class on probably the single most important piece of legislation that has hit the used car dealers in my history of being the director. And I don't say that lightly because we've gone through a lot of different things with as is and you know three day rights of rescission and all those things that we do typically year after year. But this one is a major change in tax policy for the state of Utah, okay? The state of Utah has a, has a tax law that deals with sales tax and income taxes. This is the bill that was presented. It's um, way too many pages long, but it only deals with one segment of sales tax, okay, and income taxes. The state of Utah, <clears throat> the state of Utah over the past year and a half, legislators have been kind of meeting, I won't call it secretly, but amongst themselves is probably better said, to review our current tax policy as it relates to sales and income taxes, okay? The reason they are doing that is because the current sales tax system we have in place is not sustainable. What that means is if we keep the sales tax rate where it is and we make no changes with our sales tax policies and our law, we would be somewhere in the 10 to 11% sales tax rate by 2025. Now the legislature, for good for them that they're looking forward to see how we're going to um, look forward to making changes now rather than waiting until it gets out of hand, affecting business and, and all sorts of segments of the economy. They're willing to look at it in the now. The, the thing that we had the most grief with in dealing with this subject is the lack of information. This um, bill here that is nearly 8,000 lines long, it's actually it's a little over 8,000 lines long, did not come out until the end of the third week of the session, and there's only seven and a half weeks of the session. And it made some really major changes. Um, there were a lot of groups that were involved in this process. 
we, as the Association Solutions, we are part of a group called the Business Coalition on Capitol Hill, which is made up of associations across the state of Utah. There's nearly 50 associations that are executive directors like I am, and we meet together to discuss business issues, because a lot of times all of us can't handle things like workers' comp and insurance and those things that affect all businesses, okay? And so we kind of get together and kind of work on that, and you guys go work on this, and I'll go work on this, and you guys go work on this, and we'll have it all covered, and let the legislators know from the business coalition what we like and what we don't. <clears throat> this bill, when it came out, how, let me back up. Let me ask you a question. How many of you heard in the news that we had a $1.2 billion surplus? Okay, that was in the news, been in the news for like months, okay? Before the session, clear back at least of the first year, actually last fall, they were suspecting about a $1.2 billion surplus. That means they collected more money than what was in the budget, okay? Now that in and of itself, and this is why you always have to be careful how you read it and what you read in the press, okay? Because 1.7, or excuse me, $1.2 billion did not necessarily apply to just sales tax. And I've tried to illustrate it here on the board for you. I apologize for my uh, rough hand writing, and hopefully I spelled all the words right today, <laughs> okay? I think I went back and reviewed. Let me review with you what the legislature's intent was, okay? They set a goal here to do what we call broaden the base and lower the rate. So if we have a current sales tax rate, an income tax rate, and we can lower that rate but have more people pay it, that's better, right? We all pay less, it's like sales tax on food, right? Sales tax on food is, should be for everybody to eat, so everybody pays sales tax, so that's broadening the base. If everybody's paying that, then the rate can be lower, okay? That was kind of the goal of the legislature to broaden the base and lower the rate. On the left-hand side of the board is the, in, so about right here, this is illustrating, we're gonna talk about two taxes. One of them is income tax, and the other one is sales tax. And the sales tax is a little more complicated, and I'm, I'm boiling this down as close as I can to keep this simple as I can. So if I get, if I start going too much for you, say, you know, it's kinda like, ask a question or something, okay? Income taxes, that's what we pay when we make money. We make X amount of dollars, the state charges an income tax rate, and that money comes into the state tax commission. Where does that money go? By, by constitution, by the Utah constitution, all the money, and we're a unique state in this, all money for income taxes goes to education, period. Nothing else can be so. They can't take it out there to build roads. They can't take anything else except education. That's where you heard that there was a $1.2 billion surplus. That's a lot of money. That's good because our economy has grown, people's income has grown, our unemployment is low. Those are all good indicators, okay? So what they were considering doing this to get this number more in line was to do a tax reduction, somewhere in the rate of one to 2%. So we're gonna reduce that rate by one to 2%, which means people will pay less income taxes. So that means everybody's gonna have a tax decrease. Nobody ever argues with that, right? I like paying less, everybody does, okay? Here's the other side of the coin. <clears throat> Currently, we have sales tax that is only on goods. Okay, so don't pay attention to that, don't get ahead of me yet. Sales tax on goods, that's things we buy the grocery store, except sales tax on food is not on every, all kinds of food still, but all kinds of goods, okay? We go buy hardware, we go to Home Depot and buy supplies, we go to wherever, we go to your dealership and buy a car, right? So therefore, that sales tax, money that comes in. Who's the number one generator of sales tax in the state of Utah? Used to be food, but until they changed that, guess who's number one? You guys, okay? Automotive collects more, um, if I remember the number, don't hold this to me, but somewhere around 17% of all sales taxes collected by car dealers in the automotive industry. That's sizable, okay? The problem with that is the sales on goods that I just talked about are down over the last several years of about 40%. So that means the, the sales tax rate that we're charging, even though we have the rate staying the same, they're collecting less revenue, okay? The revenue down, we still had, even though the revenue, or the percentage is down 40%, we still had last year, because 
our economy was so good, based on our past year's budget, we still had a $220 million surplus. Okay? So then the legislature says, well, let's look at this picture and let's maybe reduce this so we don't have so much surplus here. Now, when I talk about the sales tax rate, I'm going to talk about the state rate. When you guys do your sales tax, you know, you're paying somewhere between, what, 685 and 7 point whatever it is, right? Depending on where your location is. Everybody, maybe, some may be the same, some may be different, but that's always based on your location. Uh, why is that? Good question. So the question is, why are the rates different? Because the state rate, which I put right here, the state rate for sales tax is 4.7%. That never changes unless they do it by statute or by legislative change. Okay, That stays the same. Where we get the variation is because Midvale City may not have a zoo, arts, and parks tax. They may not have a, a tourism tax. They may not. There's about Gosh, I can't remember now, but there's a number of taxes that can be added on sales tax for certain purposes. That's probably the easiest way to explain that. So based on where you're at, you're going to get those variations. Okay, uh, Recreation area like Moab or Park City or whatever, they're, they're very high in their tourism side end of taxes and they typically are higher. Some of the local rural, rural areas are much less because they're not affected by the local numbers. Okay, What we're going to talk about today is this rate right here. 4.7%. Okay, Here's what the legislature, because of this problem with our sales tax going down, and we all know about eBay and all that, you know, we don't go to we don't go to Macy's department store and buy stuff. We go to Macy's and look at stuff, then we go home and order it online, right? And we have Amazon, we have all those things. Those things are in the process of basically because of national issues, those processes will come, but that's not going to be for some time to if we're going to charge sales tax on a nationwide basis. Okay. Uh, nationwide sales tax. Okay, so because our sales are down, people are doing more eBay and all those things. The taxes don't come back to the state. Then uh, we need to, the state said we need to look at a different alternative on how to collect money to support all the other service we do to build roads to all those things that are not education but everything else that we fund in the state. <clears throat> the good part about this is that it does force the state to look at their budgets and keep them in line. What the proposal, and this was the new proposal in the tax bill, said let's do a sales tax on services. We're a very service, high service oriented state. Most of, our rev most of the revenue that comes in, particularly on the income tax side, people are doing services and they're paying income taxes. Okay? But there's no sales tax collect. Now you go wash your car, there are no taxes. You go to the barber, the hairstylist, do you pay tax? Nope. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of services that people provide. Let me give you a great example. We used to all go buy, a, when our lawnmower got a little rough, we'd go buy a new lawnmower and we'd pay sales tax on a three or $400 lawnmower, right? What do people do today? They don't go buy a new lawnmower because they can't be bothered with that. They go, hire, they go hire Zach to go cut the grass, right? Or they'll go hire a company to do that, high school kids, whatever. Is that tax? The answer is no. So what the intention of the legislature was is let's add this component as a new collectible tax. Okay, That means everything that we, for the most part, do, services and goods, are now going to be taxed. Because this is such a major component of our economy, the legislature is saying let's go back to this and broaden the base and lower the rates. So let's take this and instead of charging 4.7 for all of this, Let's do a, a rate reduction of two in the discussions I put to as low as 3.1%. That's a sizable decrease on sales tax. And what that does is because we're adding so many more people paying sales, on, sales tax on goods and services, that's where it will broaden the base. The legislature's intention was this. We can, even though this looks like a new tax and a new increase, their philosophy is, we're giving a whole bunch of them back here and we're reducing, reducing the rates on all these. It should be a net effect to the benefit of the resident of the state of Utah. And they had all their PhD accountants and all that, I guess, verify those numbers because that's where they get them from. Okay? There were several things that came into play that we really had some concerns on and I put them here. One of them is business transactions. So if I if I have a business transaction, somebody that comes into my business, 
I'm, and I have to buy something or a, buy a service, I'm going to have to pay sales tax on that now. Can I pass that on? Can I? There was this what's called layering effect where sales tax would be paid on different services and different goods and things. I'll give you a good example. Kennecott, because I know the gentleman who's the director of the Mining Association, this was about a $450 million loss to them be just for their management of, you know, at the, at the Bingham Copper Mine, you, know, you always see these films about <gasps> they blow up stuff. They actually have third party people come in and do that. That would be subject to sales tax. That in and of itself was almost half a billion, $443 million it would cost them. <clears throat> then there's the lien on top of that of the contractor does that, he has subcontracts and they're all gonna pay. Building a house, okay? I go buy the wood, the cement and all that, each one of those, am I gonna pay sales tax on that? And then everything to keep at, again, it's this layering effect that we had to deal with. Second part of that in the discussion, which we really hated, was point of sale because there was discussion on why shouldn't the sales tax for goods and services, um, why shouldn't it go to where the person lives? So if Wayne Jones goes to your dealership and buys a car, okay, shouldn't that sales tax go to where I live? That, that was a discussion. Can you imagine the chaos that would be created for the auto industry for every customer you had come in the door, you gotta find out what city or local municipality they're in, and you have to send that tax to them. I mean, talk about an administrative nightmare. And who's gonna get it right? Nobody, including the state, okay? Again, these are the discussions that have taken place. Here's the big piece that really affects us. We, we were not as concerned about all of this stuff I've talked about so far as we are this last element. The last element here, and we sent out a communication to everybody on this, it is to eliminate the exemptions. What exemptions do we have? What's the big one? Trade in, right? You all read your mail, great. Okay, we have that ability, okay? They looked at 17 different exemptions. We were number two. They listed them by the total number of revenue that was there. You know what number one is? I put a question mark there because I wanted you to think. You'd never guess in 100 years, I wouldn't have. <clears throat> Water. Water's the number one exemption for the total volume of, of money that was out there. Auto's number two, okay? Anybody know the history on why we have a sales tax trade difference on automobiles? So if you remember when sales tax first came out, it was on new goods and services, okay? Sell something new. In this case of us, it's a new car, right? We pay the sales tax on it, okay? And they're saying, yeah, but when the car's resold, we don't have to pay sales tax on it, right? Oh, well maybe we better not lose that revenue. Let's create a trade difference that says, if I have a 12,000 or a car when I bought it, and I trade it in at $8,000, Okay, and I have that 8,000, I paid the sales tax for there, but I get a trade difference when I go buy the next one, right? So that's kind of the history of where that came from. So the legislature said, we are not gonna pick and choose, we're gonna do winners and losers, we're gonna eliminate all 17 of these exemptions. Okay, that's why you got the emails and the notices and stuff over the last couple months, okay? The association being involved in the middle of all this said, we need to maintain the um, sales tax trade difference. That is a huge, huge deal. We even had discussion from some legislators and arguments saying, well, if I buy my car from my neighbor, why shouldn't I have the same thing? Certainly a valid point, okay? We had other legislators who um, said, well, we're not gonna do this just for you, but, we'll, uh, but we either gotta do it for everybody or we do it for nobody. As a backup plan, because when this was going three and a half, four weeks into the session, the writing was pretty much on the wall that said, nobody's gonna get their exemption, and this bill is going to pass. That was reassured by leadership in the House and the Senate, and by a majority of the people, and they were keeping their caucuses close together, meaning all the Republicans, all the Democrats are all on board to do all this. So here we are as a business community and as an association to say, how do we do that? When, first of all, we told them what they were doing is not right, particularly that since they didn't give us an option to look at other uh, things that could be done. But more importantly, so we said, okay, if we are going to lose that, what could we do to keep it? And it, as all of this goes back to what? Revenue, okay? So if we could put a revenue formula together to maintain the trade difference on an automobile, what could we do? 
we went to the sponsor of this bill, who is a gentleman from uh, Heber City. He lives up in Heber City, he represents Summit County. We went to him, told him the history, we went through the numbers with him, what the economic impact, and I'm not gonna get into all the details of what the economic impact and all these other things are falling into place, but it's huge, more so than what it is. We even offered to say, you keep our sales tax trade difference, and instead of us going down to 3.1% on the sale, let's make car sales 3.2 or 3.3 or somewhere, so we're gonna pay a little bit of a premium to have that trade difference. At the end of the day, we didn't have to do that because there was so much pressure from all of the groups that the legislature decided, rightly so, that they should abandon this bill and not let it pass this session. That was uh, two weeks before the session ended. So this was a very critical thing. We worked a lot of long hours on this to make sure that you had that covered. <clears throat> this bill is not going away. The bill that was passed in place of this says there's going to be a task force formed, okay? The task force will be made up of legislators, basically, and people in the business community. In the last meeting I had with the governor about um, four days before the legislative session ended, the governor assured me that the business community will have input into this now and that everybody will be heard. This is why we have to be at the table, okay? Because if we're not at the table, where are we? We're on the menu, right? We're gonna get eaten alive, okay? Sometime between now and July 1st, I expect that that task force will have met and we'll have input from the business community and we'll have some kind of a recommendation because July 1 is the first part of the fiscal year for the state. July 1 is their new fiscal year. That's why we renew our licenses, July 1. Sometime between now and July 1 is what's going to happen is this bill is gonna come forward. The question is, what is it gonna look like? The better question is, what do you want it to look like? Okay? Everybody in here is really important. Now, anybody have any questions on this before I jump you back to your book? Because the question now is, what can we do? What can you do as an independent dealer, as a business person here in Utah, what can you do to help the association take care of this stuff? And by the way, if any of you want to take a picture of this before you go, you're welcome to, so you don't have to copy the whole board. Okay, so what, what do we need to do? So what I just explained to you, I just covered on page one and two. That was a lot on page one and two, wasn't it? You got a lot of detail. Page three says, in the bold there, what can you be doing right now? The first thing is, I want you to all find, go back, and this is your assignment, okay? Because you're all supposed to have three hours of credit, so you can go back and spend 10 minutes. 10 minutes is all it takes. Go back and go to the website there. It's on the second line. It's le.utah.gov. If you go to le.utah.gov, it's their state legislature's main web page. Just scroll down to the bottom, and it'll say, who represents me? And it'll ask you for, and just click on that, and it'll ask you for an address. You type in, there's, I'm showing my age, aren't I? You dad enter that in your home address, and it will show you who your house member is, and who your Senate member is. You need to know who both of those are. Now, I don't care whether you're Democratic, Republic, Democrat, Republican, or Independent, or something else. You need to find out who those people are because you guys are the most powerful lobbyists on Capitol Hill. I haven't been able to get everybody to realize that. They think I can just take care of everything, but you guys vote for these people, okay? They want to hear from you. Part two of that is when you find out who your House and member a House and Senate member are, go back to that, click on it again, and type in your business address, okay, where your dealership is. If you have multiple dealerships, type in multiple address and make a list or do what you need to do to find out, make a list of who those representatives and senators are, okay? Here's what that will do. As you, um, when, you when you those are pulled up, you can actually click on them, okay? So you can click on your senator, It'll tell you his name, his contact information, and everything about him. Okay, they have to disclose all that information. There's going to be a point between, sometime between now and July 1, that you're gonna be getting probably multiple communications from the association that are gonna say, contact your representative and senator now. That doesn't mean I can do it next week. As soon as you get that, it's an action item that needs, it's gonna need to be done right 
now, okay? And when, and when we contact you, we're gonna say, you just, all you need to do is sell it, tell your senator, vote yes on the new tax proposal. Vote no on the new tax proposal. Vote yes on keeping the exemption for used car, or for car dealers. Uh, you know, we'll send that message to you. And that's as simple as it needs to be. The message can go in the subject line. You can hit their email address, and the subject line is vote yes on tax reform. Because if you put a long narrative in the body of that, they typically won't read it anyway. I mean, they're getting four or 500, and they'll probably get that many off session on the subject. So you want to put your message, so they're going to look at what the subject is. What's somebody, what, are, what is one of my constituents? And I always would have you put in the body of your email, I'm a constituent that lives in your district, or I am a constituent who owns a business in your district, because they're all very interested in the business and the revenue that comes through their area as well. Okay, are you willing to accept that challenge, all of you? I hope you are. Okay, question. I don't know that I'm on this email list. If you, we got your email there, you are, whether you're a member or not. The better way to fix that is step two on this page. You step right into my next subject. The best way to be informed, okay, rather than just having your email addresses, you all should be a member of the association. I can't imagine that any of you don't think you would get value for $325 a year to handle stuff like this, like that we do every single year. Zach, you've been a member for years and years. Has it been worth your money? Yes. Okay. Many of you others, okay? About half this room is members, half are not. You need to invest less than a dollar a day into your business, into your profession. You guys probably spend more than that on Diet Coke, right? So invest a dollar in your day in your business. We work for you on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> That's the uh, second thing you need to do. Um, the third thing is as we send out information on this and the process that we're gonna be going through, we do not really know where this is gonna end up at. The third thing to do is when we send out communications to you, we need you to comment back. I like it, I hate it, here's a suggestion. Whatever that is, we need to have that, okay? This is your chance to have a voice in your profession, in your industry, because this is your livelihood. This is your livelihood, okay? So make sure that you cover that, okay? Any questions so far? Turning over the page. <clears throat> um, I, I put in the very last, this is my, one of my favorite sayings, and that's the one I already used, that we have to be at the table, because if we're not, we're on the menu, okay? And that's a reality. So out of all this bill that we just talked about, there's only a couple paragraphs that apply to us. And this ha the paragraph that I put on the bottom of that page allows for the trade sa sales tax trade difference on a vehicle. We're talking about two paragraphs in a 8,000 line bill, okay? But that's important. That's how come those things are important. Questions, comments? Are y'all a little nervous? If any of you are not going, nah, no problem, I'm worried for you. Okay, you should be nervous because I'm nervous. I've been doing this a lot of years and there aren't many things that make me nervous on Capitol Hill, but this one really does. Okay, any questions before we go on? <coughs> okay, moving along, uh, page five. Now we're gonna get into all the fund bills that went on during the session. This is kind of the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on. Typically, the association never goes to Capitol Hill to promote legislation, but this is a bill that we did. We usually only do it every two, three, four years. This is a bill that we actually took to Capitol Hill, uh, for the most part, for the tax commission, and some things that we need to do to help clean up our industry. This was a dealership licensing amendments bill, is what they titled that. I didn't agree with the title, but it is what it is. This bill and all these bills that are listed here will show an implementation date, an effective date. You'll see this one is October. Many of them are May 14th. Why is May 14th gonna be important? Because that's 60 days after the session, okay? So, by the way, uh, the governor has till the 3rd of April to sign bills, so he has that amount of time after the session to veto or to sign or to just let go into law. This particular bill goes into effect October 1st, okay? Sometimes the tax commission needs a little more time than July 1st to implement stuff. In this case, we changed the definition of a body shop. And it's kind of like, well, why do we care? Well, uh, what's happening with the body shop industry, which there are a number of dealers who are body shops. And in this paragraph that, where it says body shop definition change, you'll see that there are words that are lined out and words that are underlined. 
Anything that is lined out is a deletion to the code, and anything that is underlined is an addition to the code. So in the, here you can see how we change it. Body shop means a business. In the case, this case, we change business to person. Why did we need to do that? Because unfortunately, we have judges out there that say, hey, I'm just Wayne Jones. I'm just repairing cars in my garage. I'm not a business. I just do it on the side. Oh, well, by definition, it means you're a business. Oh, no problem. You're off. And yet they're out there doing stuff illegally. Okay? So we change that to person. By state statute, a person can include a corporation, a business, a person, any kind of entity that is out there. And then we put rebuilding, restoring, repairing, or repainting. It says primarily. I don't paint the whole car. I only paint the front half. Okay? Again, the argument. And then the other part that was deleted is damaged by collision or natural disaster. That narrowed that down again. So this gives a little bit broader, but specific definition to a body shot. Okay? How many of you know in the state of Utah we can unbrand a title? Anybody know that? Actually, we can. It's not something that is done very often. When the uh, branding bill was uh, run quite a number of years ago, there was created a little narrow window for theft recoveries. So an insurance company or person had the ability that if a theft recovery was recovered like six months later, the insurance company had settled with the claimant, and, but it had a salvage certificate because they were required by law to put that in there. Okay? We eliminated all that. No vehicle in the state of Utah can have a brand taken off of a vehicle. That's a good thing. We even had a reputation nationally, even though this is such a narrow window, we had a reputation nationally that, oh, you talking on brand titles. Well, the fa that statement is true. We could. So we eliminated that to uh, take care of that. We also put on the next page, on page six, we also put uh, some helps for the insurance companies so they could properly brand them so they had certain time periods and ways to be able to deal with salvage vehicles as it relates to a theft recovery versus a vehicle that had physical damage. You know, something that's stolen that's going to be recovered maybe later. Okay? Next section down, halfway down, is on transporter plates. It seems like there has been a big abuse of transporter plates. You know, all, all know about transporter plates, right? Unfortunately, everybody does, does not understand what you can and cannot do with a transporter plate. So we put that in here, okay? A transporter license permits the licensee to transport or deliver motor vehicles to manufacturing, assembling, and distributing point from de a dealer to dealers, distributors, sales agents, to or from detail or repair shops into financial institutions or places of storage from points of repossession. It's designed from a point A to B, B to A. Okay? Don't put a transporter plate on your spouse's vehicle. Don't use it for anything other than this. Because some dealers were saying, well, I can't get enough plates. I can't get enough dealer plates. I'm just going to go get 30 transporter plates and I throw them on whatever I want, give them to my neighbors and whatever. Okay? I will tell you with this change that um, the, well, one more change on this before I get to that, is that transporter plates in the past, Wayne Jones Company, my company, Association Solutions, I could have gone in and got transporter plates, okay, and applied as a transporter, with the transporter license. We eliminated that that said only those people who are licensed by the division can get transporter plates, okay? So there's a limitation on that. The one thing I will tell you is that word will be going out when this goes into effect is that, um, they, you know, law enforcement will be hot on transporter plates. If they're seeing a transporter plate out at 10.30 at night with a boatload of kids in them, guess who's going to get stopped and impounded? So the best way we can do this is control it ourselves. Okay? So make sure you do that. Loaded demonstrations. Last year we talked about this in the class and it came as a suggestion. Why can't we just use a plate for a loaded demonstration? A guy wants to you know, take the Suburban, haul his boat to Lake Powell for a week. Why do I have to go get a loaded demonstration for that as an example? This eliminates that. It puts loaded demonstrations on commercial vehicles that are 25, tw excuse me, 26,000 pounds or greater. So it applies that loaded demonstration, which was the original intent as we went back and looked. That was the original intent is on commercial vehicles. So before there was three things you can't use a dealer plate for. What were they? One was a loaded demonstration. No more. You can still go do a loaded demonstration. What were the other two? Rented or a leased vehicle, right? What's the other one? in lieu of registration. Can't get the title out of California. I'll just throw a dealer plate on there for a guy. Example of, okay, example for you. Next section halfway down on page seven is dealer plates. The dealer plates, um, the, I'll just tell you right now, 
Uh, Alan Shinney is doing a fabulous job. He is the g director of motor vehicle enforcement. And he tells me, he says, um, we need to make sure we provide enough plates for dealers so that they can do the commerce they need. So what we did with dealer plates is it used to be a formula. You got two plates because you were a dealer, and then you got five plates for every 25 sales you did after that. We increased that two to five, okay? And then kept the 25 per uh, number of sales. That counts wholesale transactions. You send a car to the shredder. Anything you sell, you need to make sure they're reported, but make sure that that, um, that, that number complies so that you can get every year when you're new. I always have dealers calling me. How come I only got eight plates this year? Last year I got 12. Well, did you send in your wholesale report us out? Oh, dang, I forgot to do that. Well, technically you're supposed to do that. It's a lot, okay? And then so, you carry over from year to year? Yeah, it goes from based on the last year's Good question. Uh, that's rate, that's uh, based on the last year's sales. And again, wholesale, retail, everything is where that number comes from. Question? Yeah, I, I, I've gotten different responses from the MBD on this. Yep. That, uh, report of sale, monthly report of sale. Uh -huh. We only list the wholesale stuff for the stuff that went out of state. Yes. Um, You're going to list those two things on there for sure. Okay. Um, but then on the, the number of sales there, um, do we put the amount that we listed or the amount of overall? Uh, no, you're just going to put you're just going to put what's on that form because all your retail sales, that's a good question. All the retail sales are going to be tracked by the state system. So everything you retail and you plate, that's all taken care of. It's just the wholesale side, if you will, that you need to make sure you document. The other thing that is not in your book that I'll tell you is that the wholesale monthly report of sale, it's not just wholesale, but the monthly report of sale in the past, we found a little flaw in there because the uh, uh, enforcement division was saying you have to submit that report by the 15th or 10th, actually, the next month. No longer do you have to do that, okay? Oh, if you don't have any. So if you have no wholesale report of sales, you don't have to submit the report. Because I went to them and I always ask them the tough question, you know, our dealers want to comply with this, but please show me where it says this in rule or code that, you, that we have to do this. They looked and said, Oh, that must have been an internal something or other. I don't see we need to do that anymore, so now it's gone. Another reason why we work for when you. Is that, effective? that is effective so, now. So it's April 1 today. Yep. You don't have to do it. And that is no yeah. April Fool's joke. <laughs> okay, so another reason, another thing that we have to put on that form mm -hmm. is wholesale, sell. Out of state. Out of state. If you have any of those. You didn't fill out a temporary. If you still have those, you still submit them. You're still submitting when you have those sales. Right. But I have a lot of dealers who said, why do you have to send this stupid form in when I haven't had any wholesale or out of state or you know anything that happened on this form? And the answer is, you don't have to anymore. Good. Okay, rah, yeah. rah. One last yeah. thing. Okay. Right. They will justify, good question. So let me, let me kind of restate this so it, uh, so it fits in with everything. If you go to Alan Shinney and say, Alan, I need some more plates. And you're maybe right on the border. Let's say you sold 50 cars just for fun. Okay. And you just need to sell three or four more to get to the next plate. Alan's going to give it to you. In fact, he said, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because he would if he were here. If they're a member of your association, just tell them come and see me. I'll give them whatever the heck plates they want. Seriously, you said that, okay? So there's a lot of, a lot of reason to belong to the association. But if you need more plates, they're obviously going to go back and review your history. If you're only selling three or four cars a year and you want six plates, it's probably not going to happen. Well, actually, you would there. But if you wanted 12 plates, that's probably not going to happen, okay? Again, we need to control our dealer plates because if we don't, legislature is going to keep hammering us on that. Question? So there's... As of right now, effective immediately, each dealer will get five plates instead of two. You will need in your application if you need more plates than what you're currently getting when you do your renewal. Okay. If you can't wait till your renewal, contact Motor Vehicle Enforcement and say, I need more plates. That's what you're to do. So what, maybe I'm not maximizing my, my business, but I'm, I only have two. I'm not here to solve all your business. But I'm just kidding. I, I only have two dealer <laughs> plates. Um, and we sold. 400 cars last year, but we don't feel like we need to get that many. Uh, I feel that if, if I got more, am I wrong? If I got more, my insurance rate mm -hmm. goes up and all that kind of 
Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great point because just because you can get them, does that mean you should? And you're a great example. If you can operate, if you sell 400 cars a year and you can operate with two, de two dealer plates, more power to you because what did it do? Just saved you a whole bunch of money on your insurance, right? Now I sound like a guy co ed, don't I? <laughs> we could say, what was it? Sorry. My, my, boys from Vernon, my boys from Vernon Insurance will get a chuckle out of this one. <laughs> but yes, you're right. Because you can qualify for the number, doesn't mean you have to get them because it's a function. Because all your insurance premiums are going to be based on how many, what the insurance liability is, and that's the number of plates that are out there. But we found there's been a lot of dealers who just need two or three more plates to really function like they need to, to be profitable. And the state's willing to work with you on that. Okay, does that help? Okay, I'm sure you didn't miss anything. Oh, and then the last thing on the bottom of page seven, it goes to reported lost or stolen plates. You, if you're going to get a plate replaced, you have to account for all your plates if you have one lost or stolen. It has to be reported to motor vehicle enforcement and the local jurisdiction where it was lost or stolen. Okay, that has to be there. That plate's gonna go um, in, into NCIC and be tracked. But you are required. some. Particularly the bigger dealerships have so many plates they lose or misplace or have one stolen, it's kind of like, ah, we don't care. We'll just go get another one, okay? If you want to go get another plate, you're gonna have to account for all your plates, okay? Over on page eight um, is on uh, license plate bills. Gosh, it wouldn't be a fun session if we didn't have a whole bunch of specialty plates, right? Oh gosh, I get tired of saying that every year. I still like the black magic marker thing and just drawing whatever you want on the plate, right? <laughs> These are the plates that actually passed. There were two that didn't pass. Let me just give you a couple that did. Uh, and uh, by the way, all the plate effective dates go into effect October 1st. The reason we have so many plates is, uh, especially plates, is because everybody has a cause and they want to put it on their car. Okay? Let's talk about the first one, special group plate for motorcycle awareness. Okay? So there's one for there. Yeah, for who are riders, that's a great thing, right? But it's especially played just like an autism plate or a school plate or a Boy Scout plate or any of the others. Next one is on top of page nine, transportation of veterans to memorial support group. You've seen all these veteran groups go to Washington. Money from that goes to support that. Civil Air Patrol, they gotta have their own. Special group license plate amendments. This one has to do with fraternal uh, and metaphysical ideals designed to teach ethical and philosophical Philosophical matters. I had to get that all in. Basically, that was brought, so you know, by the Freemasons. If you're a Mason out there, you can now have your own plate. I'm just wondering if the Catholics are going to have theirs next, and you know, to go down the list of all the. Just kidding. Okay, another plate. There was a bill, that is a bill that did not pass, that had to do with the front plate versus the back plate issue. Okay. We worked that actually pretty hard. Law enforcement won again, the bill did not pass, that it would allow you to only have a plate on the back of the car, okay? A lot of manufacturers don't have manufacturer place for a plate. People are going, it's still a secondary offense, okay? So if you look at down, I'll bet you can't leave here and within two minutes you can't see a car without a plate on the front, right, to the first intersection. It is not a primary offense, which means an officer is not gonna pull you over for that. But if they pull you over because you were speeding, they can also cite you for that as well. Law enforcement is concerned about that when we have amber alerts and all these other things that are going on. Yet, yeah, talking with my people I know on law enforcement with the new technology and plate readers and even UDOT with their toll roads, will be able to track those vehicles where they have a front and back uh, plate either way. So if they didn't have a front plate, they could still track them. But law enforcement won out. <clears throat> so that's okay, okay? Uh, let's see, I don't know, I think that totals is up now somewhere around mid-70s for the number of specialty plates we have, to so you if you're interested. Uh, did I finish them? Silver Patrol, I talked about, yep, did talk about those. On page 10 are motor vehicle bills. This has to do with a bad check fee if those of you are buy here, pay here. If you're collecting checks or somebody writes you a check and there's a uh, bad, it's a bad check and it's sent back, the state statute said you can only charge as much as $20 to, for a dishonored check. That was bumped to $35. That's all that says, okay? Big wow, but it's something. The next one is on autonomous vehicles. These are self-driving cars. This allows for 
an autonomous vehicle company to test drive a vehicle in the state of Utah. And we'll be an important test ground for this because we have a lot of snow on the ground in the winter. And autonomous vehicles right now don't work well in the snow because they can't see the lines and the other uh, features that are out there. But while they're testing those, they are not required to have a plate and registration, those sorts of things. But if you have an autonomous vehicle, there's a public side that says that you have to, the vehicle has to be properly titled, registered, and insured. And that was not in the statute before, so that was added. <clears throat> Page 11, unlawful installation of a tracking device. This is again for buy here, pay here. If you're putting a tracking device on there, so if your customer quits paying you, you can track to see where the car is, that now in the state of Utah has to be disclosed. Before it was optional, which a lot of the people did, but if you have a tracking device on there, it's required. Uh, to have your customer know that that's the case. And if you're looking at tracking devices, our association has a number of companies that could help you with that. Towing revisions on page 11. Actually wanted you to, uh, this is a bill that passed, but we took all the ugly part out of this. So go over to page 12. We're gonna talk about the uh, language that was removed in this bill. We worked with, <laughs> I'll just tell you, the towing industry is, I'll be polite today, is a little bit dysfunctional at times. There's actually a towing council. If any of you are doing tow truck companies, you need to participate in the towing advisory board that is out there that deals with all these towing issues. The part we objected to in the towing bill said, as you know, if you go get a vehicle out of impound, they're supposed to notify you, right, even as a lien holder and, and owner of that vehicle. That all is still intact. But, and then if you go get that vehicle, you have to pay the towing and the storage and a DUI impound fee and any other charges that were there. If you look at the bottom of the first paragraph, it says that the, uh, you have to make contact with the motor vehicle carrier within five days. If you don't within five days and you fail to make that contact, you are guilty of an infraction and the court may impose a fine up to $300. So now what, we're gonna add $300 to the already $400 impound fee plus the storage and towing and so forth. It's kinda like, time out folks. This is stuff that we didn't cause. Why are we having to pay that? In fact, it really opened the door for us to address the DOI impound fee and we're still working further to see if we can help with that one as well. Okay, anybody have any questions on that one? Safety inspection, okay. Just two quick things on safety inspection you'll see on page 13, they actually increase the safety inspection fees. Okay, you all will go like this when I say we have a safety inspection program, don't we? Everybody say yes we do, but it depends on what vehicle we're talking about, correct? Okay, so if you do have one that's required, they actually increase the fee, a motorcycle from seven to $14 uh, for, uh, for a motor vehicle, 15 to $30 and 20 to 40 on a four wheel drive split axle, et cetera. So those fees went up. I will tell you in the conversation, I had a lot of conversations on safety inspection. There is a real flavor up there, I think again, to look at addressing safety inspection and implementing some of the safety inspection provisions we had before. The most common and agreed to part of that was um, requiring a safety inspection when a vehicle changes ownership. I'll go buy a car, if I own it for 15 years, I don't have to inspect it except the first time I bought it to get it registered. But any time a vehicle has changed. How, what's your, do you guys like that? Do you don't like it? Okay. It, I'm sure you guys are seeing tons and tons of safety violations and things for cars that are traded in, right? Okay, so we think that's a, that's a good thing. These are th some of the things that we're going to be sending out to you. That, if you like it and you say so in the class, make sure you send back and say the same thing to us. Do you like it or don't you like it? Because we, we represent you. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next one is on um, electronic driver's license on the bottom of page 13. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, we all look at, I left my cell phone there, but we all look at ce our cell phones. Can we, why can't we just put our cell phone uh, our driver's license on our cell phone. Well, that's great, but if I get pulled over, I don't necessarily want to give my whole life to the officer. So this actually is to help them identify whether the driver's license division can put together a satisfactory driver's electronic driver's license provision. So I could, instead of carrying a card in my wallet, I could have it on my phone. That's what this does. There's, um, okay. On page 14 is vehicle registration records amendment. There has been a problem with some of the private property owners who own parking lots to request information on vehicles left or violators that they had impounded. That is no longer, that database is no longer available to them. They shouldn't have that database, the whole database. So that has changed. 
Um, motor assisted transportation amendments. This is the DUI scooter law. Okay, so no longer can you operate a scooter in town and be drunk. Good thing, right? <laughs> Some things. So they actually define this as also a low speed vehicle, so it doesn't, it's not in, which would make it like, uh, and make it subject to uh, provisions for a bicycle or a moped or, you know, small motor vehicle. So that changed as well. Questions? Power sports side, for those of you who are doing those or may uh, come across that. Off highway, this on page, top of page 15, off, way, off highway vehicle permit amendments. There was a reciprocity between a lot of the surrounding states when somebody from out of state comes in and uses their ATV. Utah basically had a reciprocal agreement with all the other surrounding states. Well, guess what? None of the surrounding states have that reciprocal agreement, so if I take mine over to Colorado, I have to pay their fee. Utah eliminated there, so they're the same as all the others. So you can take your stuff over to another state, you're gonna have to pay their registration fee, which you had to anyway, but if they're coming here, they get a pay. Uh, traffic code amendment, you'll love this one. This is the one we talked a little bit about last year for having motorcycles go between cars on the road. This one is fairly restrictive though. It says that it has to be a two lane road and the traffic has to be stopped. So if the traffic stopped, let's say on State Street down here, two or more lanes, it's three here, all the traffic's backed up. If I'm a motorcycle operator, I can go between the lanes down to the light legally now with this bill, okay? I again, caution you to be careful, okay? Vessel amendments, we, <laughs> the uh, Parks and Recreation found a real problem out there that people were getting their 1979 Hobie Cat sailboat registered and had a decal and then they put it on their Mastercraft, $150,000 Mastercraft boat and they were only paying the fees for the little sailboat, okay? If you do that, it's now a substantial fine for that, not only having to pay back, but there's also criminal provisions that go with that, okay? The street legal ATV, that allows any street legal vehicle to be used in any county in the state. This bill was just a cleanup. It was just a clarification on something that was a problem in the, lo in the law that legislative research looked at and said there's a problem we needed to fix. Emissions bill. How many of you heard about uh, us talk about a cash for clunkers bill this session? Not too many. There was actually a bill that came out, this is the one, um, and it actually did not pass. Uh, so on that where it says effective date, cross that out and said did not pass. The only reason it didn't pass is because it had no funding. It requested $6.5 million out of the general fund to be able to allow a person who met an income level, they had to be at least 100% or less of the federal poverty level, and they had to have a vehicle that would not pass safety inspection and cost a certain amount to do that. This allowed them to apply for a grant up to $5,500 that they could get through the health department. They could get that money, take it to your dealership, add that to their down payment and get rid of their old car, which is their tier zero and tier one car that are the worst, worst polluters on the road, okay? That would be requirements to go to the shredder and would put them in a car. We kind of stayed a little more neutral on this, but we did support this from the standpoint that we always support good quality clean air. And frankly, between all us kids here, that's gonna put more money to down payment for people who are, um, who, who really need more money for down payment to put in them a decent car. Okay, any questions on that? The way that was first written, we did not like that at all. I had the, for those of you who have been around for a while, I had the cash for clunkers flavor to it and we did not like that. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see, top of page 18, uh, House Bill 139, motor vehicle emission requirements. This actually has to do with, remember year, for years we've talked about the trucks out there that slam their foot on there and blows all the black smoke out. This added more penalties and, and, uh, and um, uh, process for the state to go to and repeat offenders would be reported and it became more of a health issue than it did. I don't like that stuff blowing in my face, okay? Emission testing on House Bill 163 was just a fix. If you look on the second to the bottom line, it just changed the model year from 1997 to 98. This had to do with the diesel testing program. Uh, the uh, pilot program that they're doing in Utah County just changed the year for that, okay? Page 19, I always wanna bring the stuff we killed because there's always, or that we did not allow to pass. The first one here is the vehicle property tax amendments. This is the third year in a row. What this bill, um, 
as it was drafted, said that if I bought a car and I paid my age-based fees on that vehicle, and I turned around and sold it to another person that had already been paid, that that next person would not have to pay that. It's like the old taxes used to be. Remember, you used to get credit for, you, if you think through that a little bit, the administration side of that, I mean, you have to go research every car to see when that was paid, right? So we were able to kill this bill again. It's not going to happen. On the carbon monoxide on boats, I know there's a lot of boaters in our industry. I put this one in here. Said that if you had a new boat, it had to have a carbon monoxide detection system. That did not pass as well. And tinted windows. There's always a lot of discussion on tinted windows. This bill is proposing to reduce window tinting on the driver passenger side only to go from 37% opacity to 25% opacity. Okay, so that means you could have it darker. Okay, that did not pass as well. And then the last one, uh, next one on page 20 is positionary lien. I've talked to a lot of dealers who try to go get vehicles out of impound yards, and the impound yard won't say, well, if you want your car, pay me all the stuff, I'll bring it out here and you look at it. You know, you couldn't go in there and see what the condition of the vehicle was, see if it was worth getting out of jail or not. And uh, we put it, this bill actually came up and we put our little provision there that says that it would allow us to inspect that vehicle. There were some other problems with this, that's why it didn't pass. The next one on uh, House Bill uh, 354 is peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. Many of you may have seen the report at the Salt Lake Airport where they were uh, citing people who were coming to the airport. You know, you get online like you, you know, the Airbnb thing, you come and come to Salt Lake and you can rent my house while I'm gone. They were trying to do the same thing with car rental, or yes, car rentals. And so you'd call me, I'd take my car out to the airport, pick you up, and then you could take my car for a week up skiing or whatever. There's, there's no provision, and particularly with the airport, has very strict um, requirements against that. This was to do away with that. That bill did not pass. On page 21 is the car rental amendments bill. This would not allow for car share. So one would say we want to allow it, the other one. So one was proposed by the car rental industry, the other one was uh, proposed excuse me, by the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing people, and neither one of those ended up passing. Decided to leave it how it was. Almost done in the home stretch here. What are we doing for time? Oh, we're in good shape. We're toward the end here. A um, Couple of things to look at on this page. You'll notice that there's some changes in sales tax rate. The bottom line for you right now, effective, um, Effective because if you look at the first section, there's on November 6, Utah voters approved Proposition 3 for Medicaid expansion. That affects sales tax because that's how that was going to be funded. So the rate, sales tax rate from 4.7% will increase by 0.15%. And then you'll see all these cities and counties that are in here Nephi Pleasant Grove, Morgan County, Utah County. My suggestion to you is go to tax.utah.gov. You can click on the icon there. And, it'll t and you can go to your business address and it'll tell you exactly what your sales tax rate is. I suggest, highly suggest that you do that every quarter at least. Make sure you're, because municipalities can change theirs at will too. They can do that at no particular interval, okay? On page 23 is on recall, okay? Anybody had any recall issues lately? No? Good, well, we're glad to hear that. We have had a number of calls here in our office concerning recalls. We've had a number, of, those calls have come from dealers who have attorneys suing them because a dealer did not give a disclosure on a recall that said this car that I bought has a recall, okay? So the question becomes, do we have a recall requirement? The answer is no, we do not federally nor statewide. We have no requirement to disclose a recall on a vehicle, okay? What we've worked on over the last year and a half, and we talked about this in our class um, a year and a half, or last year, is to put together a recall notice for that. It's a notice that says there may or may not be a recall in this vehicle. It doesn't say if there is, here's what you do. If there isn't, here's what you do. It just says, Mr. Customer, there may or may not be a recall in this, uh, on this vehicle. Uh, only the manufacturer can fix that. You need to go to the a dealer that is represents that manufacturer and they will be able to repair that. We did this because we needed to show due diligence with the community out there that we do care about these types of things as it relates to recalls. 
Okay, and we have a simple disclosure. And bring here it is right here. I didn't bring one with me. We have a new disclosure that allows for you to disclose that to your customer. It says, hey, there may or may not be a recall. Here's how you do it. Has a safercar.gov website in there and gives them full instructions. So it's more of a service to your customers than it is anything else. It does not disclose anything that says it has been taken care of, it hasn't been taken care of. It's just a, that disclosure. That one will be available on May 1st here in our office yep. as well as our other. Yeah, so that form, uh, that uh, recall form will be available May 1st, okay? We just made a last minute change to that, otherwise it'd be right now. Does that apply to a particular model year? Nope, does not. Typically, we don't see recalls on real old stuff. It's typically on the newer stuff. But, I mean, how many weeks go by that you don't hear about a recall? Not very many, okay? They're always happening out there. So, so we suggest that's one good due diligence thing. It also helps your customer understand, hey, there may be a recall. Here's how you check, okay? On page 24 is on curbing. I will tell you that with the uh, change where we started at with, uh, with uh, our class today in talking about taxes is that there is an anticipation that curbing will skyrocket if in fact something goes through as we discussed today. The motor vehicle enforcement has, we've had great lengthy discussions with them and I will just tell you right now that the motor vehicle enforcement is putting all of their available manpower on curbing right now but they are requesting your help. If you s Two things, if you see people who are out there parking cars for sale that shouldn't be, they need to know about it. You can go to mvd.utah.gov and you can report it without even your name being on there. So if it's your best friend or whatever, report those guys. Why should they compete with you guys? They're not paying insurance, right? They're not paying any of that stuff. Why are you letting them compete? Here's the worst part, and here's where it may come back and bite some of you is that as they go through and do this curbing and they catch these curbers, they're gonna start finding out where they're getting their cars from or where they're selling their cars from. If you are actively involved in buying cars from curbers, people are selling on open title, you're gonna be cited for assisting an unlicensed dealer. Okay, so don't, if you're buying cars out there, guys are walking in or you have an arrangement with you know, John Smith and he's bringing you cars every week, why is, is John Smith a dealer? Yes, no problem. If John Smith is not a dealer, you better demand that there, his name be on every one of those titles because you are complicit in that of assisting an unlicensed dealer. Everybody okay with that? Because that's what the law says. I'm not making this stuff up. That's where we can really help the state because the state says dealers are their own worst enemy. They buy these cars all the time. We see it, we investigate it, we get that, and we find out he bought 32 cars over the last three months from John Smith. Well, what are they thinking? Yeah. We bought them at a good price, but, okay? So there you go. Make, make sure that you understand that you can and probably will be cited because not motor vehicle enforcement is focusing specifically on complaints, but everything else they will be focusing on curbing for probably the next six months. And that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. So what if you see it like on KSL and stuff? Report it. If you don't want to report it, call us. Call one of my team members. Uh, they can do that. One thing I just learned about is that they have internet generated numbers, cell numbers. Yes. Two numbers. Sure. Yeah. Can I catch them? <laughs> We're not going to catch them all. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you what, there's going to be a large percentage of them that are doing business with you guys. I can just tell you that because the state sees it all the time. And if we're going to keep our good relationship with them, what can we do to help ourselves to help them do that? These guys are really on our side. Even though they wear guns and badges, they're here to help us. They really have a good business attitude for that. Okay? So I want you to uh, think about that. Uh, who has questions or things that uh, we have not answered? It's not an issue if we take a vehicle on trade that nope. the, the name doesn't match. And actually, I'll recant, recant my statement. The answer is yes, because if somebody's taking a trade into you, first of all, it has to be, their name has to be on the title, get a trade difference, first place. Second thought I had was um, their name has to be on the title unless they're an immediate family member, like I'm selling my kid's car because he's gone to school. I sold grandma's car or grandma, pa grandpa passed away or whatever. Those are the, there are, there's a very window of exceptions for that, okay? The real answer to your question is yes, wh and why shouldn't that person's name be on the title? Because if it isn't, they're probably Kerbin anyway, right? Okay, well, so name on the title is going to be a really important thing. Make sure all those transactions have who you're doing business with, name on the title. We'll get stuff like they bought it on K-Sale, it turned out to be junk, 
So they, their name is written on the title, they didn't register it, and they just reassign it over to us. Is that? Uh, probably with your specific situation, I'll have to deal with that when we get through. Let's talk about that after the okay. class. We yeah, so. 50% of the time, it is perverse doing it. Yep. Yeah, if, if it's a one-off thing, you know, yeah, yeah not a problem, that. not a problem, yeah. Uh, let me just mention my last thing, because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, nobody should be walking out this room today with either being a member or an application filled out with the credit card information to belong to the association. I can't imagine that you can think there's no reason to belong, can anybody give me a reason why not to belong to the association? Maybe it's because you don't like Wayne, I don't know. And that's okay if it is, but let me know. I'm just kidding. Everybody every loves penny, me. Every penny no, is worth, worth signing up for a yeah. membership. Yeah. So we, need, we've, we had a huge increase in membership when we put our first um, notice out there with the tax policy bill. But as I said before, you guys are in a very, very critical time in our industry with this tax uh, change that is coming up. And if you think it's just going to go away or you just can think Wayne's going to handle it, you better think twice. You need to start joining. If you're not a joiner, write out a nice check for a donation and just call it a donation. I don't care. Okay? It costs money to be on Capitol Hill. That's all there is to it. Okay? Now, um, I mentioned in the very last page there has to do with the guys from Vernon Insurance. One of the questions that came up before was on dealer plates. You know, I, I sell 400 cars a year, but I only have two dealer plates. Good function of why I only insure two plates is because of insurance costs and so forth. So. Uh, I just saw him walk in the door, that's why I'm giving a plug, but the very last page on there is Vernon Insurance. Vic and Vince are back there in the back. And uh, come on up, come on up front, and I'm going to let you give me two minutes, and then we're going to ask any last questions, and we'll have you out of here. Wait. Wait. We had an hour. No, you don't. We've got a full an hour here, guys. <laughs> Rocking off that lucky. I'm Vince, this is Vic, Vernon Insurance here in Bannerville. Uh, we specialize in workers' comp liability, all types of bonds. Real quick for you guys, for the sake of time, you need to keep track of these two things that we were going to tell you about. Number one, you guys would be shocked of how many people are afraid, business owners are afraid of their insurance agent. Vic and I went on an account this last year in the fall, and they is a good size account. <clears throat> she, he sold about many, about 60 to 120 cars a month because I haven't seen my agent in 10 years. I'm scared. We reviewed him of what we of the service that we provided, educated him, talked to him about the association, and uh, ended up uh, leaving with him, with us, with more knowledge. And he ended up going up the, to have insurance with us. So, and half the reason why is because uh, there were some situations that he wasn't sure he should make a claim on, and he didn't actually have an open conversation with his agent. Where that's something that we uh, definitely recommend: get us involved, get us uh, talking out loud to see what's going to be best for you guys and your outfit. If it's going to be something that's going to be between five to ten thousand bucks on a claim, that will depend on what type of dealer you are. So that's something we can discuss about what we'll do to help you out. Great. Um, do, you know, do you know how we? Excuse me for question. Because I wanted to put in a point here. Remember how we talked about earlier about attorneys, and if you're going to have an attorney, you need to know one that knows the auto industry. It's exactly true with insurance. There are a lot of insurance guys out there who do not understand the parameters of auto insurance. I see it all the time. Dealers call me and say, "Hey, this claim. Why didn't they pay that?" All these guys, because they know car insurance like nobody else I know. Okay. And last but not least, the biggest one we've seen is that uh, the customer will say, "Hey, we need to file a claim on our car," and it turns out that there was like a, a thirty thousand dollar truck that was stolen. They've only got like one hundred fifty thousand dollars in their inventory, but in reality, in the bigger picture, they got around a half a million. And they say, "Well." I should be covered properly. Well, that's not how the game is played. A lot of business owners do not grasp the concept of how claims are handled. And it's best to be like proactive and be there up front, let them know how the game is played, rather than being caught in the thick of things. So, very important for you guys to be educated <coughs> on what you're paying for. And with us, what sets us apart, we know the industry very well. The other thing is, uh, we do reviews at the end once a year, or twice a year, or how often do you need. So, and also we pick up the phone, come claim time, and walk you guys through the claim. So, thank you for your time. Vic, you have anything else? So, by, by the way, I will also mention you get a sizable discount if you're a member of the association. You work on their and they, they have great, great rates. So, they don't just raise the rate 10%, so you can be a member. It's a real deal. 
any other comments or questions? If any of you have individual questions, come see me after we're done here. Shannon's out at the table out there. She can collect your application, whether you can pay with your credit card, and we're waiving the sign-up fee for that, so it's only $325 today. We hope you'll all be members. Thank you for coming.